Deuteronomy says in 1019, so you too must show love to foreigners, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. <laughs> so here it gets real personal now, right? This is like, if you forget that you were once a mess too, and you start acting like up on your high horse that you're not going to help somebody who needs help, this is a problem. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. There's no problem that any person has that God's not big enough to help them. You don't have to be the one to help every single person in the world, but you do have to take on your assignment of the people that are in your sphere. Well, actually, you don't have to. But things don't turn out well if you turn your back on the poor because you forgot that you were once poor. Maybe not the way I was, but if you didn't know the Lord, you were set for eternal damnation. You believe that, right? And now because you know him, you made that decision. Today, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise <laughs> to the thief on the cross. He didn't have a whole lot of time left, did he? Well, I need to go get baptized. Well, no, I'm sorry. They're not taking you down off the cross to go get baptized. You call me Lord, you'll be with me today in paradise. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> this expands it a little bit in Zechariah 7. It says, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Judge fairly and show mercy and kindness to one another. Don't oppress, come on, widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. What's up, guys? Come on. You can read, right? You have this? Let's say it together. Do not oppress widows orphans, foreigners, and the poor. True religion, it says in the New Testament, that's from Zechariah 7, true religion is what? Minister to the orphans and the widows, right? It's right there. Don't oppress them and don't scheme against each other. Verse 11, your ancestors refused to listen to what? That message that you can't turn your back on people who need help. And what happened? They stubbornly turned away and put their fingers in their ears to keep from hearing. Whew, not my job. I don't have to go help them. Oh, really? And what if somebody said that when you were in that mess? No, no. Pay it forward, brother. Pay it forward. You got help, you help somebody else. Somebody pays for your coffee in the, in the drive-up line, you pay for the guy behind you. Right? Six hours that happened one time at a Starbucks. Every person for six hours paid for the person behind them when they knew the person in front of them. That's so cool, isn't it? That's such a Christian thing. Verse 12, they made their hearts as hard as stone so they could not hear the instructions or the messages that the Lord of the heaven's armies had sent them by his spirit through the earlier prophets. Oh, boy, 13 is an eye-opener, isn't it? Since they refused to listen when I called to them, I would not listen when they called to me says the Lord of heaven's armies. As with a whirlwind, I scattered them among the distant nations where they lived as strangers. So wait a minute. You were a stranger. God took you in, but then you turned your back on people that needed help, and you became a stranger again. That's what that says. They refused to listen to me. I didn't listen to them. Like a whirlwind, I scattered them, and they became strangers. Now, I'm not trying to bring you down here. I'm sorry. Not a lot of you are smiling right now. It's going to get better because you're not turning your back on the poor. But this is what goes on on the altar. People are like, what should I pray for? Oh, man, that's easy. God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Start there. He'll always answer that one. <laughs> right? That's a good one. How can I be more like you today? Before I leave, how much time do you have? God could say back. It's not just surface prayers, oh, I need this, I need that. It's like, no, Lord, I need you. I need to lose my old nature, and I need to take on your nature 24-7, right? Like every second, I need your nature in me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to put my fingers in my ears when you're trying to talk to me because you're, I'm not listening to you, and then when I do cry out to you, you don't want to hear me because that's not how the formula works. It's like, I'm grateful every day that I'm still alive, right? I mean, you want to live that way. We don't always think that way. Uh, but there's some serious implications here if you turn your back on that refugee. But that could just be an unsaved person. It could be that refugee that doesn't know God. And, and God's saying, no, you're going to have to, uh, 
you're going to have to step out of your comfort zone a little bit here, and you're going to have to talk to them about me. Because what if nobody did that to you? Somebody else was inconvenienced and didn't do what they thought they were going to do that day because they stopped and talked to you. I'm sure glad about that. So then the next little line says, the ultimate sign of acceptance for an asylum seeker is to receive citizenship in the country that they have adopted as their own. Anybody here got a green card or became a citizen in America after not having been here? Got a couple over here from Brazil. I mean, how valuable is that thing to you? That you have now a passport in the new country. Come on. Awesome. Well, we have a passport that's stamped the kingdom of God. We were foreigners and strangers, but now we come in and now we are fellow citizens of a different kingdom. But you were an asylum seeker before you got in. So that's all he's saying. Don't forget that. In Deuteronomy 18, you could look at that. We mostly know the verse 18. A lot of us do anyway. Thou shalt remember the Lord your God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth in order that he may establish his covenant. Before that, there's other warnings, though, that says, hey, don't forget, you're going into a land that the houses are already built and the crops have already been planted. You're not going to have to do any of the work you normally would. Don't forget that I'm giving that to you and that you're blessed because of that and forget and turn your back on a stranger. Uh, what about Ruth? She was one of those. And you remember Boaz let her pick on the sides of the field. She could go out and get, don't forget the stranger. Show God's love. And that's what he says, if you read the rest of that line, in between the two boxes on there, it says, that's the position, Paul declares, in which Gentile Christians now find themselves in Ephesians, that we were those asylum seekers, and now we are in the kingdom of God. And then in Ephesians 2, it says, so the Messiah came and gave the good news. Peace has come. Now, if you haven't been in a war, you might not appreciate how valuable peace is. But if you were thinking of committing suicide, you were in a war. The devil was trying to take you out. Now all of a sudden, peace has come. War has stopped. If, you're left, if you left Syria in the middle of a civil war and landed in a place in Europe, the war has stopped. You're in a safe place. You're like, oh my God, I never thought I'd get out of that place. But here I am. So how could I turn my back on somebody else that's coming out of that? Pay it forward. No. If he did it for you, you help them. And he wants us to live in this place of gratitude, right? Start that way on your altar. And then it says, peace, that is, for those of you who were a long way away, and peace, too, for those who were close at hand. Through him, capital H, Jesus, Ephesians 2.18, through him, you see, we both have access to the Father in one spirit. He means Jews and Gentiles. This is the result. You are no longer foreigners or strangers. No, you are fellow citizens with God's holy people. You are members of God's household. How many are glad about that? Good. Once they were foreigners and strangers in relation to Israel, the family of the one true God, but now they are full members. Not because they've accepted the Jewish law or circumcision, but simply because what Jesus himself had accomplished. What Jesus has done is to make and declare peace. Peace is one of the best love words in the world, especially if you're a refugee or an asylum seeker. It's a wonderful thing to discover that peace has been declared. Remember that famous picture of World War II where the guy's bending over? <laughs> the celebration that happened when America knew the World War II was over. Hitler had been defeated. And then the next paragraph says, Gentiles and Jews alike are now to be at home in the same family. This must have sounded as extraordinary and revolutionary to traditional Jews. And the guy who wrote it, Paul himself, had of course been a traditional Jew, as it was wonderful and exhilarating for the Gentiles who had looked at Judaism from the outside and felt drawn to the God of whom the Jewish scriptures had spoken. You with me? Then he says this powerful thing. The closing verses of chapter 2 in Ephesians take one of the central symbols of Judaism and turn it, on, turn it inside out. Verse 20 in Ephesians 2. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with King Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is fitted together and grows into a holy temple of the Lord. You too are being built up together in him into a place where God will live by the Spirit. 
So if you look around you, you're sitting next to another brick. <laughs> Just tell the person, you're a good looking brick. God's going to use you in his building. <laughs> so look, we are the living stones that he's using to build this new temple. He's the cornerstone. How valuable is that? But we are all here for a reason. And that's why we have to respect each other as well. Even if we don't get along, we don't agree on every little point of doctrine or every piece of our decisions that we make. No, but we're fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family as other Christians. Oh, you're not too excited about this. All right, that's good. Thank you. I'll thank this side over here. Flip it over to the other side. <laughs> I mean, I'm just stunned by the beauty of that picture of the face of Jesus. Can you put that back up? Just put the picture of the face up there because I really like that. The one, the color picture. Yeah, let's just leave that up there while we do this part. It says the temple in Jerusalem was not only the religious heart of the nation and the place of pilgrimage for Jews throughout the world, it was also political, social, musical, cultural heart of Jerusalem, as well as the place of celebration and feasting. The reason for all this was that Israel's God, Yahweh, had promised to live there. Where did he live? In the temple, right? That's why they went there. And within the temple, there were three chambers, and he lived in the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go back there. And he didn't always come out if his altar wasn't in good shape. That's why they tied a rope to his leg. If he fell down dead in there, they could pull him out without going behind the curtain. The same curtain, when Jesus said, it is finished, that ripped from the top to the bottom. It's a violent word. It says that the heavens were rendered, rend open, and from top to bottom, that thing was open. And Bill Johnson likes to say, not to let people in, but to let God out. <laughs> in you. Ha! Oh, what a blessing. We have that in us. Oh, it was believed by many there that that was the place where heaven met earth. Look at the person next to you. You are the place where heaven meets earth. Oh, that's good news. He's living on the inside of me. It's not in the temple anymore. You're the temple. He's living inside of you. That's where heaven and earth meet. As it is in heaven, let it be here on earth. In me. It's revolutionary. And they didn't like it. A lot of the Jews were like, no way. Can't. We're not letting those hell's angels in. Now, Paul is declaring that the living God is constructing a new temple. It consists not of stones and arches and pillars and altars, but of human beings. Until Paul, nobody had said anything quite like this. One might almost say that God himself has, in a sense, become a stranger and asylum seeker within his own world. Just meditate on that one for a minute. What does that mean? He loves you so much. He's coming after you. But you still have to let him in. He's looking for a home in you. He's the asylum seeker looking for a new place inside of you. How many want to let him in? Come on, let's just lift our hand. I'll let you in, Lord. I'm not going to keep you out. I don't want to refine you to one little tiny corner over here. I want you ruling throughout my whole temple in every part, in every room of the house. I'm not going to keep you locked up in the corner upstairs and only go up and see you once in a while. You have full reign in mine. I don't want you being an asylum seeker in my temple. I want you here all the time. That was such a powerful analogy for me. Think of Paul on the road to Damascus. Who's chasing who? God was the asylum seeker saying, Paul, it's hard for you to persecute me, isn't it? And he's like, well, who are you? I'm Jesus. Huh. And all of a sudden he calls him Lord. Saw the light. God found a home in Paul's heart and it changed the world because he opened up the doors to his heart and said yes. Takes a whole new picture of that knocking on the door, doesn't it? That one that we all know with the lantern outside. There's no handle on the outside door, and God's knocking. I'm looking to make a home in your heart. Will you let me in? Say yes. Good job.